Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 um, Tube Feeding Workshop. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Joy mcveigh Hugic, and I am an enteral nutrition consumer. I've been on um, home enteral nutrition therapy since 2010, and before that I was on home um, parenteral nutrition therapy. And um, I'm on the OLE board, board of trustees, and I'm also an OLE ambassador. And um, I really look forward to meeting you all after this session if we haven't met yet. Um, I see some new faces as well as some people I've known for several years now. It's good to see many of you. And um, whether you've been on nutrition support for five months or 25 years, I hope that you'll learn something new today that you may not have known before. Um, I'd like to thank um, Chris Nader and Nestle Health Science, Chris is in the back, um, for partially sponsoring today's event. Um, I have learned so much over the years, even when I think that I'm not going to learn something new, I guarantee you I'll learn something new from each of you today. Um, to let you all know, um, this is being streamed live. So there's two things about that. One is if you ask a question, make sure you speak into the microphone. The other thing is if you're going to share any personal health information, just be aware that it's being recorded and streamed live, so that information will be included. I'm going to do a quick run through of the agenda for today and then I will announce our first two speakers. We will be doing, um, it's called Dietitian's Recipe for Optimal Formula, where you'll get to hear from Anna Tuttle and Alyssa Norris, who are both local. From there, you'll hear from Lisa Epp, who will be addressing common complaints with tube feeding, and she's from the Mayo Clinic. After that, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of all three of our um, registered dietitians today. And then afterwards, um, Dr. Manpreet Mundy from the Mayo Clinic will be talking about feeding tube options. Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. And then finally, we're doing hands-on um, and question and answers with the manufacturers. We have AMT, Boston Scientific, Cook, Halyard Health, Medline, and Mode. So you'll have an opportunity to stop by, look at their products, ask questions, um, even more so than you might be able to do at the table. Um, you'll have access to each of them. All right. Well, Alyssa Norris is a registered dietitian at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. There she works in the level four surgical neonatal intensive care unit in addition to the children's intestinal rehabilitation clinic managing the short bowel and intestinal failure patients in the tri-state area. Her interest in research includes very low birth weight infants, oral aversion in gastrointestinal surgery patients, and fiber as a treatment for short bowel patients. She's a member of the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, ASPEN, and is a contributor to the ASPEN neonatal section newsletter and social media team and is a member of the Aspen Professional Development Committee. Anna Tuttle is a clinical dietitian at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital in Memphis, which is where we are. <laughs> she primarily works with the outpatient GI clinic and the subspecialty clinics for esophageal, insophi I always say this wrong. Encephalic esophagitis. esophagitis. I don't know why I always have, I shouldn't even just try and pronounce it. Liver, liver transplant, and Center for Intestinal Rehab at Le Bonheur Clinic, which is the CIRCLE program. Um, she enjoys the challenge of her patient's population and watching them grow and helping them with nutrition support. So we are going to hear from them now. Thank you for that kind introduction. Anna and I are also both native Memphians, so we would like to welcome all of you here to Memphis, and we are so happy the Ole Foundation has chose Memphis as their home for this year's conference. Our first disclosure is that we have no commercial or financial relationships to disclose with this presentation. Today, Anna and I will be reviewing considerations for our formula recommendations. We plan to review infant, pediatric, adolescent, and adult formula options, and also discuss how we can individualize these recipes for our patients. And then we'll also break down commercial formulas. Although there are numerous things that a medical team will consider when choosing their formula option, 
These are some of the top four things that we look into. We also pr primarily keep in mind that the literature supports that with patients who have any type of complex medical needs or really any diagnosis, their formula options and nutrition regimen should be individualized for them. So one of the first things that we're gonna look for when looking at our formulas is their age. Are they a premature infant? Are they a term infant? Um, do they need a junior slash toddler regimen, adolescent or adult? We're also going to consider their disease state. Do they have any allergies that could be present in any of these formula options? Do they have short bowel syndrome, any congenital heart defects, renal impairment, and many more disease states that can determine what type of formula would be best for them? Also, coverage is something that you may also run into and be very familiar with. Um, what is the insurance company going to provide if we're choosing a formula that maybe isn't fully covered by the insurance company or DME, is the family or caregiver going to have to pay out of pocket? Is that feasible? Or is some of these uh, formula companies going to offer an assistance program or other foundations that offer an assistance program that could help of our patients out? And then a big also consideration is the calorie concentration. How are we going to mix it to individualize it best recipe for this patient? Also, are we gonna be using powder versus liquid? And then also, there's a lot of different modulars that I'll get into that we can also add to make sure that we're choosing the optimal formula for our patient. So I'll first talk about some infant formula options. There are dozens and dozens of infant formulas out there. Um, but as you'll see in this chart, we are looking at some of the four biggest companies, um, which is Abbott, Mead Johnson, Nestle, and Nutricia. And you'll see at first we look at our standard formulas. So these are gonna be your term formula options. Um, Similac Pro Advance and Infamil Neuro Pro Infant. And then also too, those companies have premature options. So our Similac Neasure and our Infamil Inficare. And those premature options differ from the Advance and the Infant because they're designed to meet the premature infant needs. So they're gonna be higher in protein, calcium, and FOS primarily for those babies who missed out on the third trimester. Then we can look at our low lactose formulas. So Similac Sensitive, Infamil Genelese, Gerber Good Start Soothe, these are all gonna have a little bit lower lactose than our standard formulas that may be for babies who it's a little bit fussy or not as well accepted on the stomach. Then we have our partially hydrolyzed formulas. So that's where our proteins are gonna be a little bit more broken down and easier to absorb. Now these partially hydrolyzed formulas are not to be used for allergic diseases, um, and those options are Similac Total Comfort and Gerber Good Start. Now the hydrolyzed and elemental formula options, those are gonna be more broken down again than our standard and all the ones above that. So we've got our Similac Elementum, our Progestamil, and our Nutramogen. And those are also going to have a higher ratio with medium chain triglycerides and long chain triglycerides as well that can help aid in absorption of these nutrients. So our elemental options are Elicare Infant, Alphamino Infant, and Neocate Infant. And these are going to be ones that are completely broken down and ready to absorb. Um, you all may be most familiar with these in our short bowel and intestinal failure populations, as well as those who have um, eosinophilic esophagitis or other allergic diseases as well. Um, and their carb source is usually gonna be corn or sucrose. So also too, with these formulas, um, infant-based, the premature infants come 22 calories per ounce, and then your standard term formulas, as well as the Elicare, Neocate, Alphamino, um, all come 19 to 20 calories per ounce. And we say that's how they come, that's how um, the ready-to-feed versions are available, and then also if you mix per the instructions on the back of the can. These can be changed, though, with input from your medical team um, for a variety of reasons. If we're looking to optimize growth, if we're fluid restricting, if we're worried about malabsorption and need to provide extra calories, you can mix these differently with advice from the medical team, but there's also other modulars that we can add to the feeding regimen to really personalize it 
um, based on how the patient is doing and what they're able to absorb and grow off of and tolerate. Um, when we do change the way that we're mixing it, more powder versus water, that can change the osmotic load. And what that means is that if we're having a higher osmotic load, the ingredients are going to be pulling water into the stomach and can cause high output or diarrhea, which is something that we would love to avoid so that our patients can thrive and grow. And so with fat modulars, it won't change the osmotic load, so those might be commonly used. Um, some of the options for that are canola oil, soybean oil, corn oil, and corn syrup. Those are more readily available to our families and you can grab at the store. Um, MCT oil, microlipid, liquid gin, liquid protein, promote liquid protein, and binocalorie are options that are usually going to be um, still readily available for order provided through insurance, but also some options if we're looking to add some fat or protein modulars to our recipe. We also have an option of powdered modulars. So that's going to be some of your fibers, your protein again, cornstarch, duocal, non-fat dry milk readily available, polycal, soul carb, or rice cereals occasionally used. Um, and again, these charts just look at um, how much we would need to add and how many calories or protein that we can get from these added modulars. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Anna Tuttle. Thank you very much. So I'll be talking about some of the formulas we use for our pediatric population. So that's one to 10 years of age. And Ellis already did a great job about talking about the differences in the standard, hydrolyzed, and elemental. But for um, our standard ones that we usually use, we use um, Pediasure or Pediasure Entral. There's also um, an Infragrow that has the toddler transitions that can help to transition to um, out of the infant formula. Also, uh, Boost Kit Essentials and Nutrin Junior. And these are some that can be used as your sole source of nutrition, or sometimes we'll use them as supplemental um, nutrition as well. And then we have some um, increased calories also for the Pediasure 1.5 and the Boost Kit Essentials 1.5. So that's something that we might use in the patients that, who can't handle a high volume of a fluid. So we can use that with them as well. Um, so that's a good option. There are also, also the hydrolyzed protein or the hydrolyzed formula. So those proteins are a little bit broken down to help with absorption. And that's the Pediasure peptide that comes in the standard concentration and also the 1.5. Uh, Nutramage in toddler is also available. And um, Peptamin Junior for the 1.0 and 1.5. And um, we use these a lot in our um, short bowel populations as well as with some of like the liver transplant children I work with. We use a lot of these products because it's broken down a little bit so it really can help with that absorption so I can see some good growth with these patients. For the elemental formula, we have the Elecare Junior, Pure Amino Toddler, Vivonex, Alpha Amino Junior, and Neocate Junior, Neocate Splash. And as Alyssa mentioned, we use these a lot with our short bowel patients since they're um, amino acids, um, they're already broken down into that amino acid form, so that really helps with the absorption when they're missing some of their intestines. And the Neocate Splash is now nutritionally complete, so that can also help with some of those patients who don't want more of the milky formula that's available. So I just like this chart a lot because um, it shows the difference in the peptide change, so I'll show this to patients and their families sometimes. So at the top, it's the protein in your regular formula, so that's intact protein, those chains. And then in the middle, you have your hydrolyzed formula, so like I was talking about, they're a little bit broken down, some intact there as well. But um, then what we use in some of our short bowel patients, we have in the elemental formula where it's broken down into those amino acids. So as you can imagine, that's just more readily absorbed. Um, so your body doesn't have to work so hard to uh, digest those intact proteins. So we also have a few other options for our pediatric formulas. There are some soy-based ones. There's Infragrow, Toddler Transition Soy for some of those patients. Um, there's also a Bright Beginning Soy formula I forgot to put on here, but that's also available. Um, some of the big names on here, like Abbott and Nestle, they have some real food ingredient formulas available. Um, there's Pediasure Harvest and Complete Pediatric and Complete Reduced Calorie. 
Um, so if you desire to have more of a, a real food type approach to um, those enteral feedings, those are options as well. Um, there's also some clear liquid supplementation that we use sometimes with our patients, and those are the Ensure Clear and Boost Freeze. Um, something I always mention is that, of course, those don't contain fat. So those are more just like supplemental nutrition that I have with some of my patients who want just maybe a little bit of variety um, in addition to some of the tube feeding they're getting or some of the TPN they're getting as well. So those are some options for them. And plus I have some patients working in pediatrics who love juice. So that's an option to uh, give a little bit more oomph for what they're taking in as far as that goes. So for our adolescents and adults um, over 10 years of age, we have our standards, which some of these, of course, um, we see in Target or Walmart, like the Insure and Boost. There's also Osmolite and Nutrient available. And we have some of those increased calorie standard as well. So um, if they can, can't handle too much fluid or they just need a little bit more bang for their buck, there's Insure Plus, um, Osmolite 1.2, 1.5, meaning uh, 1.2 or 1.5 calories per ml. Um, also Boost Plus and Nutrin 1.5. And for the hydrolyzed options, um, we have the Pediasure Peptide, um, the 1.0 and 1.5, and there's also Vital Peptide, which is more for ages 14 to 18. It's kind of a transition to their Vital product that they have available. So it just works with the nutrient needs of that patient population. We have the Peptamin Junior 1.0 and 1.5. Um, and the elemental, those are still like the Elecare Junior, Alphamino Junior, Nuocate Junior, the ones we use a lot. And a lot of those have the different flavors, so that can be helpful. So patients um, have that option if they are taking any of it orally um, or still enterally. They like to maybe have a few different options as far as the flavor goes. And um, a great thing about those two, um, as Alyssa mentioned, we can kind of tweak the... Um, the calories per ml for that. So if they need to be at a lower um, caloric concentration, we can do that and provide them with those recipes for that. Or if they need to be at a higher concentration, we can do that as well, just depending on their history of tolerance and what um, kind of medical states they have. And there are a lot of um, real food formula options. Um, available because um, I can imagine you'd want to have more of a real food diet sometimes. So um, there's Kate Farms, Functional Formularies, Real Food Blends are available, and I think here <laughs> um, in the vendor section. So Kate Farms, they have their standard formula. There's also um, the peptide base for those patients who need more of a hydrolyzed formula. And now I see that they do have a pediatric. I believe they have a 1.5 and a 1.2. I don't know if it's readily available yet. I think that's kind of a newer product. So they have um, in ingredients include like rice and pea protein, brown rice solids. They have a superfood blends of different food concentrate and extracts like uh, Brussels sprouts, blackberry, and kale. So those are some different options they have there. And then Functional Formularies has the Liquid Hope for the adult population and the Nourish for the pediatric population. So they just, it has a lower um, caloric concentration, the Nourish does, and a little bit less of the macronutrients like the protein and fat just for, to accommodate the pediatric population. And so they have ingredients like I commonly eat like garbanzo beans, peas, rice, quinoa, broccoli, sweet potato. So that's just kind of a good variety for um, people to have as part of their tube feeding reg regimen. And real food blends, um, I messed up there. There are five different blends that are available. Um, and those include uh, got salmon, oats, and squash, beef, potatoes, and spinach. And so that's meant to add variety to the diet. Um, so it's more sim similar to a meal like maybe a family member is eating so that they have that as well. And it's usually um, used in a bolus feeding. And of course, there are homemade blended diets, which um, may be um, appropriate depending on the patient. And I would recommend discussing you know, with your medical team, um, with your registered dietitian and physician. And I know Alyssa and I um, have worked on different recipes for our patients and just to see what works best for them. And we can you know, figure out the different want to meet those macronutrient needs and making sure they can tolerate it with the volume and everything. But it is an option for different patients. Um, so the formula breakdown, of course, um, there are a few different common sources of the carbohydrates, protein, and fat. For the carbs, it might have um, sugar or maltodextrin, inulin, um, 
FOS is the fructo oligosaccharides and sucrose. Common sources of protein are the sodium and calcium uh, caseinates, milk protein concentrate, whey protein concentrate, and soy protein isolate. Um, a lot of these uh, um, formulas, like the intact ones, like PD Assure and things like that, um, they have milk in them, but they don't have the lactose. So a lot of times I have patients who are lactose intolerant, but they still can take the PD Assure because it has milk products, but it's the protein from the milk and not the sugar. Some common courses, sources of fat include um, sunflower oil, soybean oil, MCT oil, those medium chain triglycerides that can be pretty readily absorbed by the gut, and canola oil. There are also some other additions, such um, as prebiotics, you know, those food for the probiotics. That includes the oligosaccharides, polysaccharides, and um, some fruit tans in there. Can help with that gut bacteria. There's also fiber that can be added, like there's a pediasure with fiber, um, and also some patients might add a, a bit of fiber or something like that to their formula to help with their stooling habits. And as Alyssa mentioned, all those different modulars are options as well. So we might have a formula that we're using, like an elemental formula, and we might add some certain oils or something else to help increase the calories so we don't have that high osmotic load like Alyssa was discussing. And something that we use since we work in pediatrics um, to assess how they're doing on the formula is we track their changes in weight or their height and their length. Um, we go by a certain ideal growth velocity according to the age and gender that they are. So we always want to see if they're within that range. If they're a little bit below, we might add more calories or increase the rate or volume they're getting. If they're a little bit too high in there, we kind of need to reel it in. We can adjust it in the opposite way as well. So that's something that we do. Um, and also to assess tolerance, we want to see if there's increased stool output, if um, we go up on a rate or go up on a concentration, are they having issues with diarrhea or stooling too often? Are they having vomiting issues? And then also something that we do is just a gradual transition or slow increases in rate. So if we want to go up to a certain concentration, we'll just slowly do that and also just slowly increase the rate of their feeds to kind of help their gut and just help them adapt um, to those changes. And so in conclusion, um, there's not a blanket statement that there's one optimal formula that will work for everybody. So we have to just work with that individual patient to see um, what their background is, what their tolerance level is, and what their prior disease state was so we can find that optimal formula that works best for them. So. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa and Anna. Again, hold your questions, and we will be hearing from Lisa Epp now. Lisa is a registered dietitian nutritionist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and assistant professor in nutrition at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. She is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, as well as the American Society for Enteral and Parenteral Nutrition, ASPEN. She enjoys speaking at state and national organizations such as ASPEN's Nutrition Science and Practice Conference, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Food and Nutrition Conference, and the OLE Foundation. And um, I learned last night that we both are fascinated by fashion and how you can adapt your outfits even when tube feeding. So um, we're working on that for the future. So without further ado. So fashion show next year. Yes. If you have any ideas, come talk to us. All right. Okay, I have three financial disclosures here, but I will be using just evidence-based um, practice guidelines today. So I thought you might be interested to know how many people out there are on home enteral nutrition. Um, we haven't been able to answer that question um, very easily, and Dr. Mundi um, went through a lot of work with our team to kind of get um, information from Medicare as well as some of the largest infusion companies to um, really just estimate how many people are at home on tube feeding in the United States. So over 400,000 is the number that um, we came up with, and we know that that's probably an underestimate because we know that a lot of consumers are not using a supply company or an infusion company to get um, their home menstrual nutrition supplies, um, and so the population's a little bit harder to capture. 
One thing, though, that I think you would find very interesting is that Medicare spent almost $600 million on home enteral and home parenteral nutrition in 2014. Um, and so really looking at the management of specifically the population we're talking about today, home enteral nutrition, is very decentralized. And you might find this in your own community is that um, Medicare and the infusion providers are estimating that one physician is managing about one and a half patients on home enteral nutrition. So that makes it harder you know, to find those resources and people to connect with, um, maybe in your local community, which is what is great about coming to a conference like this. Um, and just to give you a little bit of perspective here, so last year, um, we managed 2,000 patients um, on home enteral nutrition. So what I would like to talk about today are kind of those common things that those patients call with questions about or that we try to manage um, by keeping our patients out of the hospital. So we all know that healthcare is changing and everyone's trying to save money um, and that includes with um, home enteral nutrition supplies, but also for hospital admissions. Um, so we know that we're in a changing environment where cost um, is part of our um, decision making um, equation, if you would say, um, and that we have penalties if our patients come back into the hospital with dehydration, for example, or a tube site infection, or granulation tissue that someone thinks is their stomach coming out of, of their tube site. And those are the kinds of things that we wanna teach people to manage so they aren't coming into the hospital to um, get care for those things. Blenderized tube feeding is another change in the management of home enteral nutrition, um, which um, may be complicating uh, managing patients, especially for that physician is only managing one or two patients, may not be able to vi uh, provide as much resources. Internet and support groups are, are changing the way we look at managing our patients as well and, and really are helping clinicians um, to reach patients with similar um, situations. So it's hard to estimate the complications that happen with home enteral nutrition, but it's been estimated that between um, five and 30% of people who have tubes get infections. Um, it's hard to estimate other complications like tube clogging or formula intolerance, but what we do know is that having a team of people that you can go to um, to help you manage these can decrease complications by about 20%. So that's how I get paid. So I want to review, like I said, some of the top um, complications that our patients um, have and kind of how we help them manage those. And hopefully you'll find some things here that can help you or um, your loved one. So we're gonna talk about dehydration, diarrhea and constipation, weight concerns, and I'm not really gonna go into formula options, but just um, kind of a statement about formulas. So this is gonna be kind of an interactive case report, so I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and, and um, answer some, some questions here. So first case report, four-year-old with cerebral palsy, um, has a G-tube and struggling with constipation. Tube feeding is 100 milliliters of Pediasure 1.5, six times a day with a 10 milliliter water flush after the feeding. So the feeding is providing about 530 milliliters of water and we estimate um, the fluid needs to be a little over a liter of water. What do you think might be a concern here? Anyone? Yes, in the white jacket. Not enough water, yep, only getting 10 mils of water flush. So a solution may be, because I would assume that doing you know, a small bolus of a 1.5 concentrated formula, probably that they can't tolerate a lot of volume at one time. So a, a solution might be to do water overnight or something like Pedialyte overnight to meet hydration needs. So some things about dehydration, 
causes dry skin, can cause headaches, just general fatigue, also can um, worsen constipation. But severe dehydration can increase heart rate and decrease blood pressure. So we definitely don't want to downplay the fact that this child is only getting about half the amount of fluid that they need. Children with special needs might have more fluid needs to, due to drooling, gut motility issues, volume intolerance, poor intake. And so really looking at estimated fluid needs for both adults and pediatrics. Now these are an estimate, but when I go through this with a lot of people, they feel like, wow, this seems like a lot of volume or a lot of water. And, and going from 500 mils a day to 1,200 mils a day might feel like a, a big volume. Um, and so you know, we would probably do that in a stepwise fashion. Um, but it's good to know kind of where we're going and then step, steps that we can take to get there. Another thing to know about formulas is that they're between 65 and 85% water. So if you're using eight ounces of a formula, you can't count that all as fluid. So it's important to know the water content of the formula that you're on, as well as with blenderized formulas, it's really difficult to determine what the water content is. So we kind of estimate that most home blenderized formulas are between 65 and 75% water. Therefore, you would wanna make sure that you give water or other fluid um, in addition to or mixed in with the blenderized feeding to make sure that you do get enough hydration. And I think sometimes this may happen when um, people change formulas um, because the water content of different formulas is different that um, sometimes um, dehydration beca can come an issue. Overhydration though can also be an issue. Um, so especially when maybe someone's new to blenderized feeding and they feel like they really want to get their blends really, really thin because they're worried that they might clog their tube, sometimes that can lead to getting too much hydration and that can lead to low sodium levels. So sometimes we do need to add salt to blenderized feeding um, to make sure that that doesn't happen, but obviously that's um, on an individualized basis. Okay, next case report. 54 year old with tonsil cancer undergoing chemo and radiation has been on a, a peg tube feeding for um, a couple of weeks with a 1.5, so that concentrated formula with fiber, and calls in. Um, so we have six dietitians that take phone calls from patients to, like I said, try to manage things at home and, and keep patients out of the hospital, and has been feeling full, nauseous, and no bowel movement in six days. What would be some of your first thoughts if you received this phone call? or if this was yourself. Anyone? Yep. Not using such a calorie concentrated formula. Okay, so more fluid would come with that, definitely. Any other thoughts? Constipation. M more water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would kind of ask some questions. Um, how much water flushes are you doing? Um, and then you kind of need to decide, is fiber helping or is fiber hurting? And fiber, fiber can be tricky. Fiber can help with constipation, but it, always, it also can cause constipation if you're not getting enough fluids. So um, sometimes we might need to think about that. Also thinking about previous diet habits, I always think of that, you know, Iowa farmer who gets a tube and he tells me I've eaten meat and potatoes my whole life and then maybe now he's getting a lot of fiber from maybe fruits and vegetables in his formula and he's thinking I'm full, I'm bloated, I don't feel comfortable and that's a big change in diet so maybe thinking about more of a gradual change. And then also just looking at medications that may be causing constipation, like pain medications. So like I said, fiber can be tricky. Fiber can help have more bowel movements when you're not having 
um, very many. Um, and this can be done either mixed in formula or as flushes. But increased activity is also a way to manage constipation, as well as meeting fluid needs, or using something like pear juice or prune juice as some of your fluid flushes, rather than just water, can kind of help stimulate and move the bowel and use something other than a medication. Diarrhea, on the other hand, can also be kind of helped with fiber. So using soluble and insoluble fiber can help kind of slow down the gut. However, aspen, which we've mentioned a couple times, doesn't recommend using fiber um, if your gut doesn't move very well or if you're at risk for having kind of a, I don't know how to explain it, bowel ischemia, like your bowel doesn't work anymore. Um, but fiber can be used for persistent diarrhea. Um, something that may be more beneficial is, uh, than fiber, and we don't know this yet, but it's being studied in a lot of areas of healthcare, is using prebiotics to help grow that good bacteria in our gut. So using something like kefir as a flush through the tube or mixed in formula might be a way to start to add that good bacteria back into your gut to help um, kind of manage bowel movements long term without having to use different powders and, and formulas and things like that. Maybe just building that good bacteria back there um, would help. My co-presenters kind of already mentioned about some modulars, but just a few other modulars that are help out there that can help with diarrhea. Nana Flakes is kind of like a dehydrated banana that can be uh, mixed up with a water flush, and that kind of thickens stool. Um, that can be used in both a hospital setting and at home. But also things that could be used would be stool thickening foods like applesauce or bananas or rice cereal that could be used as just a bolus or a part of a feeding that would thicken stool. Um, another thing that we do ask people when they call in and say they have diarrhea is just making sure that the formula that they're giving is not cold because cold formula can cause diarrhea as well as just double checking those food safety things with hang times, making sure that food isn't sitting out um, for too long. So for a home blended diet, we would recommend no more than two hours and then manufacture hang times of formulas range from anywhere from eight to 12 hours. So if someone called me from Hawaii once they got home to their beautiful state and I'm freezing in Minnesota and they tell me, that they have diarrhea, I might ask them, do you keep your formula outside, you know, out at room temperature for 24 hours? And if, especially if they're on continuous feeds, and that would be something that maybe would be a, a reason why they're having, having diarrhea. And then lastly, if feeding is going too fast, if the intestines just can't absorb that quickly, then um, we might have them slow down the rate. Okay, so this might be a little bit opposite of what you're used to thinking, but when we look at kind of our country as a whole, I think it's important to kind of look at this case report. So 30-year-old history of gastroparesis has a weight loss of 15% in the last three months. Body mass index is now 32, and if you don't know about body mass index, which I'm sure you do, um, that is kind of in the obese category. Um, but they got a jejunal feeding tube and started on enteral feeding, and her husband calls in and says, you know, she's not gaining weight, she still looks so thin, um, can we have more calories? So how would you answer that question, or what would be some of the things you might think about when it comes to that? And Lisa has a microphone, so raise your hand if you're going to answer. I know, I know exactly. <laughs> okay, well, some of the things that you may not think about is, um, and this is, these are things that are hard to talk about. You know, weight is uncomfortable to talk about, but 70% um, of Americans are overweight and 50% don't know it. So just because you're on tube feeding doesn't mean that we want to introduce other healthcare problems like the risk of diabetes or cancer or high blood pressure um, by overfeeding with tube feeding. So 
what we would like to do in a situation like this is discuss, discuss what is safe weight loss, and that would be about a 10% weight loss in six months. And then the goal would be to maintain that for a while or have about a pound of weight loss per week and, and making sure that they're getting a lower calorie but high amount of protein with their tube feeding. Um, just because, like I said, we don't want nutrition to be affected. We want protein, vitamins, and minerals to be adequate, but we also don't want to overfeed someone if they don't want to keep losing weight or, or gaining weight, and it may not be healthy for them. Um, this would be an opportunity for us to help them in a little bit of weight loss. On the flip side, though, um, we definitely have patients that do need to gain weight and do need to grow. So the first thing we would say is we would want someone to be as active as possible to prevent muscle mass. And I think we're... Uh, prevent muscle mass loss. And I think we're gonna see a lot more about this um, just in hospitals that are starting to have bikes, um, put, stationary bikes put in rooms to help um, preserve muscle in hospitalized patients. Um, and just looking at lean tissue and muscle tissue as um, kind of a predictor of, of a better quality of life. Um, so it's not just about the nutrition, darn it. Uh, but there are ways that we can increase calories. So what would be some of those ways? So we mentioned a few of these before, but using additives like Duocal or Benacalory, so either a powder or a liquid that could be mixed in something. Um, and something like Benacalory, for example, has 330 calories in 45 milliliters. So if you think of your syringe, you get a large amount of calories and a small amount of volume. Um, where Duocal, 42 calories in a tablespoon, those that can be mixed into things. Um, just regular cooking oil can definitely be used as well, like a, a tablespoon is 15 milliliters on your syringe, and you get 120 calories out of a tablespoon of olive oil. So when you're thinking about flushing, that's a very small amount of a flush with a large amount of calories. Mixing avocado and butter into a bolus feed it would be another option, or cutting back on water flushes and moving, using more flushes with fluids that have calories in them, like Powerade, Gatorade, juices, um, milk, you know, lemonade, anything like that that could be used as a fluid flush and then a, just a small amount of water flush at the end to clean out the tube, rather than 120 mils of water or eight ounces of water with the feeding, if you're trying to get in more calories, a way to do that could be replacing some of the water with calorie-containing fluids. So I think one thing that's important to note, and we kind of talked about that with the pediatric population, is nutrition needs change over time. And sometimes nutrition needs in kids continue to increase and increase and increase. And then unfortunately, as we age, our bodies get a little bit more efficient at using calories. And so sometimes we don't need as many calories. So sometimes I might have a patient who's been on tube feeding for 10 years and they say, but why do I need to come back and see you every year? I've been so stable. And then all of the sudden they start to gain weight and they don't want to. And it's because nutrition needs change over time. So we definitely want um, to kind of have our patient know what the goal is. So we like to have a weight range goal. And if they get outside that range, then that would prompt a phone call. So just kind of that awareness that different treatments or if your body's healing from a surgery or if you're just trying to maintain, all of those situations would call for different nutrition needs. So we definitely want to work with the consumer and family and, and a medical team to decide what are the goals and then make sure that we have planned follow-up so we can make sure that we're achieving those goals. So we already talked about the formulas, but I, the reason why I put this slide here is because just because you start on one thing doesn't mean that's what you have to be on forever. Or just because something is working right now, it might in a year or two need to be changed. So what's great is there's literally over 100 formulas on the market. And if you took into account making homemade blenderized recipes really 
the options are endless as to um, what formulas there could be. So don't get just discouraged if there's something that's not working. I feel like if you have a team of people that you can um, kind of rely upon, that there are options out there. So the last thing kind of I wanted to just take away is it's really easy to kind of say um, what worked for you or what worked for your mom or your son, um, but what we do try to do is provide the best evidence-based recommendations that we can and then throw in a few things that we know just works for patients. And so sometimes I think as a consumer, it could maybe get confusing if you hear a lot of different things from a lot of different people, but that's where the Ole Foundation's resources are very helpful because they do give evidence-based practice guidelines for um, solutions for things like diarrhea, constipation, things like that. All right. We will take questions now, but we're going to have the microphone come around, right? Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. So now we'll take questions um, from the audience for our dietitians. Anything from either of the sessions is welcomed. Uh, Lisa, one thing that I have found that's very effective, uh, I, first off, I've been a tube for almost five years. Uh, and that's been fitting to. Uh, I use the dangling site, 20 for French, because I use mostly a home dangerized diet. Okay. Now, on a daily basis, I always look at my urine and my skin. If your urine is, you know, ye real concentrated yellow, you know you need to increase your fluids that day. And if your skin has that alligator dry look, again, that, that's a factor. And, and that changes from day to day on how much fluid intake. So that would be a recommendation you should give your patients to keep a constant check on that. They don't have to run to the hospital ER to is it set to see if it's dehydrated? Great point, and I'm just going to recap what you just said. So two ways that are evidence-based ways to check hydration are urine color, so making sure your urine is light, or skin dryness or feeling kind of scaly skin. So if you're seeing those things, then you know you need more fluid, and that's exactly right. Now, when I often, as you mentioned, talk about um, when you run, Add uh, fluids. I drop a 12 ounce Gatorade in, into my home blenderized meal when I've been out mowing two acres of grass or something <coughs> to increase my fluid level. Great. Are there other questions? Oh, there's one over here. She's going to be in our fashion show yes. next year. <laughs> difference between prebiotics and probiotics. I'm, I know what a probiotic is, sort of, um, but should I be using both? I, I don't do either, and I probably should, yes. Okay, I hope I can give this justice, but the way I think about it is I think of probiotics being the bacteria that are in our gut that we want to be there, but we need prebiotics, which are basically food, for the bacteria in order for them to have food to grow and to stay in our gut. So in order for the probiotics to work, you need prebiotics, which is fiber, like fruits and veggies and added fibers that can feed those things so they do stay in our gut. It's a great question. Okay, this is on the same line. You mentioned flushing with two how much should, I mean, do you need a half a cup, a cup, a day, how much is needed? I'm going to let Dr. Wendy answer that question. <laughs> it, it's a great answer because honestly we don't know yet, um, but Dr. Martindale is probably leading the effort in kind of looking at home enteral nutrition 
and using kefir or other probiotics, and we're hoping to start a protocol soon as well. Uh, but essentially, he's using about 30 milliliters a day. And so it's not much. And he's actually even doing this to the extent of using it in the ICU. So a few ounces a day is what he's looking at. So hopefully, we'll get the data back as to what changes that produces in the stool. So then we'll be able to better tell if that's the right amount. But we're right in the infancy of this whole using kefir and probiotics to handle some of the GI complications. So I think in the next few years we'll have a lot more data. Any other questions? And I'll just remind the group that tomorrow afternoon in the 2.45 and the 4 o'clock sessions, Lisa will be joined by Cynthia Reddick of one of the dietitians that many of you know very well. Um, and they'll be talking about a different, um, avoiding tube clogging and skin and stoma care. So I know sometimes those issues are covered in this session. You're welcome to ask a question about that now, but there will be more information tomorrow on that. There's a question here and then over there. Yeah, just to remind everyone, it's being live streamed, so please speak into the microphone. And if you're sharing any personal information, it is being recorded and live streamed. Firstly, Lisa, excellent presentation. I always enjoy hearing you speak. So I'm excited that you presented today. Thank you. I do have a question, though, about the weight gain. Um, weight gain with medications is a common situation. These patients could be on prednisone or other medications where there's weight gain that could be misinformative to us as dietitians looking at patients thinking they're gaining weight, they're obese, but the reality is, is it may be other reasons. There could be thyroid conditions or other things going on. So how, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you be able to assist in guiding and how you deal with that? Well, to be honest, we still probably do underfeed in that situation and the reason why I say that is because a lot of times you know people are still able to eat some by mouth and I think one of the things that's hard is just to quantify how much people are eating by mouth so we really try to remove the fact that they have a feeding tube as an equation into kind of their nutrition counseling and if that person didn't have a tube and had thyroid issues and was on uh, medications making them gain weight, we would still be counseling on, you know, a healthy diet, fruits and vegetables, lowering calories, you know, trying to get enough protein. Um, so I don't really have a good answer other than I, I still tend to not provide the estimated calories. I probably still do underfeed. I don't know if you have anything else. I can add a little bit to that. I think this is one of the biggest challenges we're gonna face um, is the obese individual who's actually malnourished. So it, it fools us in terms of the scale looks good, you know, or they're gaining weight. Yeah, we're doing a great job, but they've lost so much muscle. So I think we are in the process of shifting some of our parameters that we follow. So one that we've now introduced is hand grip strength. Um, so that'll give us an idea of kind of muscle strength. Another is we're starting to use bioimpedance in our clinic, and so we have uh, equipment for half of our patients, and we're going to buy the final set, but that will give us an idea of lean muscle mass, and that's something that we can follow and make sure that that is increasing, not just fat mass, and it's very easy to do, um, and that way we can then tailor the, the enteral formula to be high protein, perhaps lower calorie than we normally would, but then following those markers like lean muscle. Uh, so make sure that our, our sarcopenic obese patient, we're not just looking at the scale, but making sure that they're gaining muscle, gaining a healthier sort of body composition. So yeah, it's a great question, and I think one of the biggest issues that we face now. Yeah. Um, you mentioned several additives, like um, Fifir, Nanoflex, Durocal, and Benecal. <clears throat> I'm worried that if I introduce any of this, it might trigger diarrhea. Should I not worry? I'll say anyone. 
um, some of the fiber, like the banana flakes and the Nutrisource fiber, um, those commonly wouldn't cause you to have any increased output or diarrhea because it would help bulk up your stool. So sometimes we often see, you know, we may give a recommendation for fiber um, and it commonly may uh, be good with everyone else, but one patient might be too much fiber. And so as long as it's the right amount, um, it shouldn't cause any diarrhea. It may actually um, cause too much bulking and you may see some constipation. Um, but with other additives, and you can um, chime in as well, with some of the oils um, and some of the fats, if it's too much, you may see an increase in diarrhea with those. So it just depends on what specifically you're adding um, and what risk you may see with each of those. Does that help answer it? And starting slowly, yes. obviously with a small amount, being at home, you know, when you're making changes, just like if you were adding something new to like a home blend, you would want to make sure that you tolerate that before you added a lot of it. Something else that, you know, I wish I had done this at the beginning of the workshop, but by a raise of hands, how many of, how many people who are consumers in the room, if you're comfortable letting us know, um, how many of you are G tube fed? Okay, you can put your hands down. How many of you are J tube fed? Because I think the answers to some of these questions and some of the advice provided might be different for the people who are J tube fed as opposed to G tube fed. Um, I know I'm J tube fed, so some of the advice and information provided. It's great information, but I can't be doing some of it because I'm feeding it into my jejunum. Um, and then also, how many of you um, bolus feed or gravity feed? Okay. And then how many of you pump feed? Okay. Now, I just, I just think it's helpful. I wish I'd done it at the beginning so you all would have known who your audience was. Um, are there other questions? Yeah. Um, wait for the mic. Thank you. Just an um, insight about adding oil to the di uh, their diet. Um, my daughter, she had an emergency. She'll be back. <laughs> uh, when she was a baby, they had us put the oil in. And after probably a week or two, I noticed the top of her head was just always oily. And I didn't know, know what it was until, you know, a couple months later, I was at the doctor's office, and they said, it's the you know, oil that I'm putting in there. So as an adult, do you think that would happen? Putting the oil in there and it's gonna come out the top of her head? I mean, she just had an oily scalp. Probably haven't heard that before. <laughs> Everyone's staring at me, so. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the in terms of the oil and this oily scalp, I mean, what I'm thinking of is we're overdoing it. Um, in that it's forming triglycerides that the body can't handle. So they're floating around. Um, so that's something you have to be cautious about. So that's why this needs to be, this change needs to occur with a team, you know, and someone's actually monitoring labs and, and making adjustments. Uh, because, you know, if I start adding a lot of oils and high calorie things to my diet, if my body can't handle it, it could cause a lot of problems. So early on if we take this stuff enterally, you know, it's going to go through our kind of chylomicrons and end up in our blood. Uh, so we see this often if someone eats ice cream um, and we collect their blood the next day. We know they haven't been truly fasting. You could just catch that layer of oil and fat in the blood. Um, so then the body tries to dispose of it. So I think the, the idea here is that in someone who's malnourished where they're underweight, you know, their body may take it up more readily, but I would work with a team to make sure that you're not overdoing it. Yeah. So I actually have one more question about oils. Um, I had heard that, I'd never heard of oil as a flesh, but I had heard of oil as a supplement for a calorie boost. What is the difference between the various different kind of oils? I had heard that some of the S oils were preferred. So each of the oils do, um, they each kind of have their own combination. Essentially, they're all fat. Um, so we also commonly with some of our patients will look at um, their labs and what they're meeting. Do they need some more essential fatty acids? So we may be leaning towards different oils to help meet those needs. Um, so it's kind of patient dependent 
um, on what their labs are portraying, what they're getting. Also, are they a, a combination of um, EN and PN? Um, what we're looking at there as well um, when we're choosing what oils to add. Um, and y'all can say what y'all. I keep talking. <laughs> no, you're you're right. So each each source of oil will provide. Um, different fatty chains. So we, we typically label, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow as well in the lipid section, but we, we label uh, short chain, medium chain, long chain um, fatty acids. So this just essentially means how many carbons are in this chain of, of the fatty acid. This is probably getting too complicated, but each of those has its own properties. So as an example, uh, soybean oil, is a perfect example where half of it, almost 50 some percent, is a carbon 18 chain linoleic acid, which is an essential fatty acid. So if you've got a child on parental nutrition, that's a must, you know? So then we would wanna use that as opposed to like a medium chain or another oil. Um, whereas if you're having trouble with getting rid of oils or there's too much accumulating, we want to lean towards the medium chain because those can go right to the liver and get oxidized. So the body clears those faster. So there, it, it gets really complicated, but there's so many different properties to them. Um, you know, and I'll kind of talk about this more tomorrow as well. Uh, but that's why, again, that team is important because it, each oil is not the same. And so you don't want to just say, oh, I need more oil, let me grab this, you may be causing a deficiency in something else. I don't know. Anything else here? Okay, another question over there. Hi, okay, so my son, he's two and a half years old and um, he has short bowel syndrome, but he, he has a rare brain disorder also called schizencephaly, so he's been tube fed like his entire life, but um, he's not very mobile and very active. So he doesn't burn a lot of calories, like they would say, like the typical child does. And um, he has Alicare Jr. for his formula, but they were overdoing having me mix his formula for a long time with a lot, a lot of extra calories. And I kept thinking, like, that doesn't seem right. Well, now they have me mixing it to less calories. And they said, like the, the nutritionist said, that he doesn't need any extra calories because now the way where he is on the growth chart, but he's not gained any weight in months. And I just feel like, I don't know, it just makes me nervous and I don't know if I should have him be pushing to have him tested to see if he has like a thyroid issue or something like that, just to make sure that um, like there's nothing I need to be worried about for his weight at all. Or am I just being, he's my first child, so I don't know if I'm just being like, kind of, I'm like, I hover a lot, so like I don't know if I need to really be that worried about it, or if I just need to just let them do their thing and let it go. No, it's okay, it sounds like you're a good mom. So it's good to be concerned about these things, because you want a child to grow, so if they're not growing, that is concerning. And yeah. sometimes, it's, as dietitians, it's hard to find that happy medium if we have children who have gained a little bit more than expected and we don't want to create another issue where if they're overweight or something like that. So sometimes, I know I've had patients where there might be a few weeks or a few months where they kind of stay at the same weight or so um, and then eventually we do want to bump up their calories maybe again. Um, if you're concerned about a thyroid condition or something like that, definitely voice that concern to your team or to your physician um, to see if you need to get them tested. But it sounds like he might, you know, if they're not very mobile, their calorie needs are, of course, a little bit different than a child who is mobile. So it's kind of hard to find that happy medium sometimes. But definitely if you're concerned, voice um, those concerns to um, your dietitian and to your um, medical provider about, you know, if you need to, they need to tweak its formula again or what their kind of, their end point is, what their game plan is for the future, which with some of these children, I mean, it's month by month as far as what they have going on and uh, how we need them to grow. But we, I know it is concerning when a child is not growing because you definitely want them to grow at that important stage in their life. Yes. Okay. Kind of on the same lines of what he was saying about the adult population, though, about lean mass, do you know if they do like mid upper arm circ circumference, have they ever measured that on him? 
Because that would be um, another thing to kind of look at outside of weight gain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that. But they have not. They haven't done that. I just, I feel like, so where he is on the growth chart, I just feel like um, they're relying on it too much because he was going like straight up because he was having too many calories. But um, the where he is, like with his height and length, like his length, they'll say, oh, he is so tall, but then he's really short on the growth chart. So I just feel like it might not be exactly correct. I don't know. And that's something too we look at um, are they proportionate mm -hmm. um, as well because um, we don't want you know when we look at a weight that could be different based on their length especially if there's different types of other disease states going on that can affect their length as well as medications um, so like you said too mid upper arm circumference is a, is a great indicator um, as well when we're looking at a nutritional status okay okay thank you thank you you've got another question here and then over there yeah, right here. Thank you. Um, uh, two things. One, a favor. When you guys speak, could you just speak into the mic so that we can hear clearly? Because when you do it from far away, we can't hear very well. Thank you. Um, my question was, um, you had put up on the board about supplements to add in for calories. And I was wondering if those were by prescription. The DuoCal and the something Benny calorie Benny. product. Are those prescription or can I buy those at a pharmacy? <laughs> Duocal and Benny calorie you can buy on Amazon. I know that. Um, not all pharmacies probably carry them, but if you ask your pharmacist to get them in, you don't need a prescription. But sometimes if you have a prescription, they would be covered by insurance. It just depends on your insurance. Okay, I know we had one back here. Are there downsides to those that they should consider? Are there downsides to those additives, those calorie sources? The question was, what are they made from and are there downsides? So I'd say to speak on the downsides, um, it just depends. You want to make sure that you discuss it with your medical team. That way that you're adding the appropriate amount um, and you're not going to run into other issues um, like we discussed, like with the added fats or risk of diarrhea or even dehydration on the other end. Um, so it's not necessarily um, often a downside in the product. It's how it's used. So you just want to make sure that it's used appropriately and discussed with your medical team. And then the sources are basically oil and whey protein in the Bene calorie, and then corn, Carbs. corn carbohydrate um, in the duo cal, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And just as with anything that you hear at this conference, um, definitely check with your, um, your doctor and your medical team before instituting any major changes. We have a question back here. Yes, I, um, I wish I had a medical team. I'm from a small town. Um, my internist says, how's your head? Your heart sounds good. Any troubles with your tube? Okay, everything's fine. And that's the extent. Um, at one point, I had to gain 10 pounds, so we added two bottles of food a day. Um, and, I mean, I've never seen a dietitian. I, I have learned so much today, um, and I would guess that my situation is probably pretty normal. Um, most, I imagine a lot of people are out there um, without a dietitian to talk to. Um, and I really appreciate um, your knowledge base and the information you're sharing. Um, I, I hope my doctor will be open and receptive when I go home to the information I've learned. Um, I, I can't believe I've waited 20 years to learn this, but um, thank you. Thanks. And I'll add a plug too. If you, um, I know in a small town it can be hard to find a dietitian, um, and if your medical doctors that you see aren't familiar with one, if you go to eatright.org, you can search um, and see if there's a dietitian registered in your area um, as well. 
that may not be associated with that team but may still be able to see you or put you in connection with somebody. That's wonderful. Any other questions? This has been so informative. Thank you all. And we are going to hear from Dr. Manpreet Mundi. He is a graduate cum laude from the University of California, San Diego, with a double major in psychology and chemistry. He obtained a degree of medical doctor from the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Dr. Mundi completed a residency program in internal medicine, followed by a fellowship in endocrinology at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. After completing the fellowship, Dr. Mundi joined the Mayo Clinic Division of Endocrinology as an NIH training grant fellow in the Dr. Michael Jensen lab with a research focus in fatty acid metabolism and obesity. Dr. Mundi subsequently joined the clinical staff at the Mayo Clinic as a consultant in the Division of Endocrinology Nutrition core group. His clinical focus is on obesity and malnutrition with a special interest in home and inpatient nutrition support. Dr. Mundi is currently an associate professor of medicine and holds the leadership positions of community core group chair and outpatient nutrition core group chair. He's also the medical director of the home enteral nutrition program and associate program director for the home parenteral and enteral nutrition program. The HPEN program at the Mayo Clinic assists 700 to 1,800 patients per year in initiating IV nutrition and tube feeding, and typically follows 1,700 to 2,000 patients annually who receive nutrition support at home. With HPEN program, Dr. Mundy takes a very active role in research with the goal of continuing to improve the quality of home nutrition support. And Dr. Mundy is also on the Oli Foundation Board of Trustees. I've had the pleasure of working with him on the board for a little over a year, and we are so grateful to have you speaking with us today. Wow, thank you for that introduction. That was impressive. And so the task I've been given is to talk about enteral access and to kind of go over uh, what are all the various options we have available uh, to us. I don't have any disclosures um, pertinent to this uh, talk. Um, and what I've done is I've kind of gone through all of the various options we have on how we get access to a patient to feed them. Um, I've brought in some videos uh, from colleagues who are gastroenterologists, so I'm an endocrinologist, um, and I've, I've had to trim them to make sure, you know, the audience isn't a little put off by it. We still have dinner to go. Um, so, you know, bear with me, we'll see how they work. And then, uh, I want to transition into NFIT, which is, I think, one of the biggest changes that's taking place in uh, home enteral nutrition. Uh, go into some of the research we've done, some of the research the FDA has done, and then our hope is to have a few question and answer sessions and then really delve into some of the new tubes that are coming out. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll get started. Um, essentially, this graph shows you in detail and it's going to be hard for me to point. I can point here, but um, okay. I don't know if I can get that angle. I'll lean forward. It's okay. I'll just point to things. So essentially, when we're looking at enteral access, we're dealing with a situation where a patient is no longer able to eat safely. Um, so in that case, and this could arise from a stroke, you know, where they're no longer able to protect their airway. Um, in, in the adult population, we also see cancers, such as head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, or even stomach or beyond that, pancreas. So a lot of cancers start to cause obstructions. So because of this, patients can't eat, yet we need to provide them nutrition. Uh, we talked a lot about the microbiome. We talked about, you know, bacteria in our gut. So still, the best way to provide nutrition, if possible, is through the gut. That's the way we like to feed. So then, how do we go about doing this? One of the options, and this commonly happens in the ICU, I, critical care docs are very quick at doing this. In fact, within an hour of hitting uh, the ICU, patient will have a nasal tube put in. And whether it's an oral gastric, so those are called OG. You may see that in medical records, but that just means through the mouth going to the stomach. 
so OG. Um, nasogastric is a more common option, and that essentially means going through the nose to the stomach. Uh, so those are two common ways we can get access. If the obstruction is beyond the stomach and we need to feed into the intestines, then we can do an NJ or an ND. And the D part refers to the duodenum, as you can see right there. That's that first part of the intestine right after the stomach. The J refers to the jejunum, which is the second part of the intestines, and those come after the, uh, the duodenum. So those are ways we can have access in the hospital to feed the patient. Um, if we're then starting to see that this individual is going to need nutritional support for longer, um, you know, like many of you here, then we start to move ahead with percutaneous tubes. Uh, and those I've listed there a number of ways we can place those. So again, tubes could be placed in the stomach and those are typically called percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, PEG. Uh, you'll hear that a lot. Uh, but that essentially means we went through the skin, not the nose or the mouth, and we did it with endoscopic guidance. So typically, this is our gastroenterologist doing this. Um, we, you can also hear the term surgical gastrostomy. That just means the surgeon did it. But if they needed to, they use laparoscopic technique. They go actually into the belly and make sure they're going into the right location. Uh, so that's another way it could be put in. And then interventional radiology can also place a tube into the stomach. And what they do is they look and use fluoroscopy. They're sort of x-rays to find the location where they are uh, and then put one in from the outside. And I'll, I'll show some videos that can kind of help with this. Um, so those are all the various options we can have a tube into the stomach. If we need to, we can also then put in a PEG, which is either a direct PEG going right into the jejunum, into the small intestines. Many of you may have those. The other option is that we can do a PEG-J, uh, um, a PEG tube, so into the stomach, and then put in a small extension through that to get to the intestines. So you can see by this diagram, there's so many different ways we have of accessing the different locations. Um, then these are just some diagrams of the tubes themselves. Uh, you can kind of see those up here as well um, later on after I'm done. The two main things I want to point out here are, uh, one is the bumper end of it. Uh, and then the other tube, the one lower down, has a balloon at the end of it. So these are the two main things that you also want to keep in mind. So as you're reading your medical records and you're going to go see a new provider, it's very important to say, oh, I had a ex-French peg tube with a bumper, you know, because that, that sort of changes how they're removed. Um, what else happens? So this is information that's very important for us. We can quickly understand what's going on on the inside. The bumper tubes are what we and our GI colleagues place initially. So they will usually start with the bumper tube. The advantage of the bumper tubes is that, to me, they can stay in much longer. In fact, some of our patients, well over a year, uh, they have the same uh, bumper tube. Um, this allows time for the track to heal. Uh, and by that I mean in normal uh, anatomy, um, the stomach is free floating. And so uh, when we go ahead and place the tube, what we're doing is bringing up the stomach and joining it to the, to the inside of the belly wall. That track needs to heal. And we typically say we need about four to six weeks we are on the cautious side and say aim for six to eight weeks. That way we know for sure. Some people will heal much quickly, so in like two weeks. Others will take longer. But the reason we want that tract to heal is that if the tube falls out or is removed, once it's healed, the stomach tends to stick to that abdominal wall. So this allows us to then be a little bit more comfortable if a tube has fallen out that we don't have the stomach fall off and now you're leaking into the belly wall. So once the tube has been removed, then we usually go ahead and put in the balloon tube 
because the advantage with the balloon tube is that even though they typically don't last longer than three months, you can replace them yourself. And many of our patients who've been taught to do this can either replace their child's tube at home or their own. So we're essentially just shipping out the tube to them. They check on them and they replace them themselves. Okay, so a little bit about how these are placed. Um, so again, bear with me. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you can handle this, I guess. Uh, but essentially, the key to placing these is the first, first uh, picture um, with the landmarks that are defined. It's actually not my picture, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, but what you're first defining is the, essentially the rib cage, the coastal margin. Um, that's very important to identify, and I'll show you some slides of where things could go wrong. Then, once that, that location has, has been identified and we know where we want to go in, we usually use a very small needle, very thin needle, often a spinal needle. This is like what you may have seen with epidurals and things like that, um, to go in and make sure we're in the correct location. This is very important, as you can see here. Um, what I'm showing you there is a CT scan with a tube going through the liver. So that's the issue with knowing you know, your landmarks and kind of identifying all of those uh, correctly. If we go too high, uh, again, the, the liver sort of comes across the belly and, and that's, an, that's an error that can happen. So we just want to be careful of that. So once we've identified that we're in the right location, the needle can be visualized then inside the stomach. So we have uh, someone with an endoscope that's, that's, you know, manning the endoscope. Someone from the outside is going in uh, with the needle. Um, and, and once we see that it's in the right location, then we can pass a wire. And I'll, I'll show you a video here. It's working. So you can see what happened there. So the endoscope is on the inside, that little picture and that's essentially grabbing the needle with a snare. And now they're able to pass a wire through that and then capture the wire with the snare. And that's the key to these placements because once you've got this wire in place, now you can then guide the tube onto it. So that's the hardest part is making sure you've got your landmarks correctly identified and then initially putting in that needle into the right location and then passing a wire through that and capturing it. Once you've done that, a lot of the work is, is actually done. So then that wire, as you can see here, is then pulled back out of the mouth. So it's a very long wire um, and, and the person operating the endoscope then has one end of the wire. The other person at the other end of, your, of the belly has the other end of the wire. And then a tube can essentially be passed onto that wire. There's all sorts of different techniques on how it could be done. But essentially, you go in from the outside, pass the tube along through the mouth, and then pull it through the other end. And then the tube is placed. And they can then secure an external disc. They can size how much you know, length we want to leave outside, and then put in the end adapter and then you're you're done so you can see here that you we make a loop over the wire with that guide wire and then essentially tighten that lubricate the tube and then just pull it right through the mouth and this is it being pulled into the mouth along the wire and then being pulled out the other end so you can see, it takes two people, um, you know, and, and, and that's the placement of the G-tube. Okay, so as I mentioned before, typically our group starts with a bumper tube uh, at the very beginning, um, and then when we need to replace them, we're replacing them with the balloon uh, at the end of it. The other option we have for many of our patients is the low profile. They prefer this just because there's no tube then dangling. Uh, but again, this has to be measured. Uh, as you can tell, with the other tubes, 
there's that external disc that's adjustable. With the low profiles, you have to have the size correct. Otherwise, it's too loose or, or actually the opposite, where you can actually push the balloon into the track if it's too tight uh, or if you're gaining weight. So these are all things that we watch for, but essentially um, with the low profile tubes, they have to be measured, um, but then it's flush against the skin. And whenever you need to provide feedings, you can then connect that adapter and then uh, feed the patient. So those are the main ways that we put in G-tubes uh, into the stomach. If in the hospital, we need to then place nasal tubes uh, beyond the stomach, this is where it's actually quite difficult. And I'll show you some of the techniques we use. It's easy to get the tube into the stomach. That can be done at the bedside. But then to have it move past the stomach is difficult because many a times when we try to do this at the bedside, because the, the end of the stomach is a big muscle called the pylorus, it starts to just loop. And then you get an S X-ray. You're like, oh yeah, I'm way in there. You know, I've I've put in a, a 10, 20 uh, inches of tube in there, but then it's just coiled in the stomach. It never went beyond. So because of it, there's a number of techniques that have been tried, and I'll I'll kind of show you, highlight some of those. Uh, one of them is electromagnetically guided. This is Core Track, is what we refer to it as a company that makes one of these, but essentially. Um, there's a sensor, you can see that at the blue part of it, that gets placed on the patient's abdomen, um, and then the tube has a, a tip that can be sensed by the sensor um, showing us where the location is. And even though this is probably small, but the graphs there are an ideal graph showing you the loop of the stomach, and then almost like a, a backward C going through the duodenum showing you that it's in the correct location. And you know this is very important because in patients who can't tolerate stomach feeds in the hospital, there's often, and, and on average in this trial, it was 22 hours. We, we sometimes encounter days before we're able to feed a patient if we're not able to do it in the stomach. You often have to wait for our GI colleagues to, to advance it or uh, our interventional radiology colleagues. So, uh, devices like this can cut that down to a few hours, which is huge because we don't want the patients to fall behind. Some of the other techniques that have been tried, and I just met someone who is developing ultrasound guided uh, technique as well, um, so that there's more to come for that. Uh, another technique is to have almost like a little endoscope, um, but have the tip there uh, illuminate so you can see those pictures they can guide the individual pushing in the tube uh, to let them know that it is, in fact, in the jejunum and beyond the stomach. So that's one technique. Others that have been tried but actually didn't work, um, I think this was called like the tiger tube. Um, but this one, what they did was they, they um, serrated the edges a bit. Um, oh, yeah, I put tiger tube there. So they serrated the edges a bit. And what the thought was that you could put this into the stomach uh, that's the same look I had as well, um, but you know, and it would it would self advance, and it did that. Um, it, it worked to some extent, but the difficult part was then pulling it back out. You know, that that posed, uh, yeah, ouch. Um, other techniques have been tried. I don't you know want to go too much into this magnetic guided, um, self uh, propelled coil shape. So lots of different things have been tried. It uh, in our experience still. Uh, the core track system works quite well, and even some of our ICU nurses can just do that on their own. Uh, but if we truly want, so with all of those other options, we can get past the stomach, but if we truly, truly want to make sure that the tip of the tube is in the jejunum, uh, then we really need our gastroenterology colleagues to come in with an endoscope and verify that it's in the right location. And there's a number of techniques that could be used, but again, the guide wire is used. So one technique is to take the guide wire um, with the endoscope, make sure it's in the right location, pull back out on the endoscope, leave the guide wire there, and then just pass the tube 
you know, and re-verify that it's in the right location. Another technique is, well, if the patient has a nasal gastric tube in place or you've gotten the tube up to the stomach, the endoscopist can then pull that tube along and then leave it in the jejunum uh, once they get there. So lots of different ways for us to get access um, in that regard. Another way, um, and I kind of bring that up here, is the peg pedge. So this is often arises in a situation where a patient has had a peg and then they no longer tolerate it, so we have to feed beyond that. So we can go in uh, with a tube, a J extension, a jejunal extension, through that same opening and then put in a tube into the jejunum. Other reasons we use this is, prime, and I'm an endocrinologist, so in patients with gastroparesis, where the stomach is not emptying quick enough, um, we use this because it allows them to then vent the stomach, you know, so that they don't have nausea or vomiting. They can actually vent the stomach contents and then feed into the jejunum. And again, here's a sample of that tube. So this is a peg with a J extension with a bumper at the end of it. So you can see that there. Um, at the blue end, you know, the tip of it, that's the part that's outside the body. What you're seeing there is one will be labeled a jejunal or feeding port. There's lots of different labels, and this is probably the most important end for this tube. Uh, because if you identify the wrong um, tip, you know, uh, bad things can happen. And I think uh, Lisa and I had a patient that uh, Lisa actually identified. She came over to my office of a patient who was intolerant to tube feeds. I don't know, for months or years, it, it was a, two years, um, this patient was intolerant to feeds, couldn't, you know, uh, figure out why. They had done all sorts of studies, had a, a, a PEG with J extension, um, and Lisa kind of looked at the x-ray, uh, you know, and said, I don't know where this tip is. This doesn't look right. I think they're feeding into the wrong end. And we, we looked at it, and that was the case. And so for two years, this patient had gone, you know, on and not being able to tolerate feeds when it was a matter of just feeding into the right port. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the things we do. And we've even gotten to the point where we have a label maker um, that our nurses use, and they will label them feed, vent, or gastric, jejunal, to make sure it's correctly identified. Uh, so that's one of the keys to this uh, procedure. Um, and again, uh, here's some data about the success rate uh, of this being placed. And even for our gastroenterology colleagues, it's sometimes difficult. It's not a 100%. Uh, placement rate. Uh, lots of uh, failures can still happen. Uh, same sort of techniques, uh, again, for placing uh, these tubes in. As you've seen, the key is if there's no tube present, we need to get a guide wire in the right location, and then we can pass a tube through that guide wire. So similar techniques to the videos you saw before. Um, so this is now uh, uh, just showing you little bit about the direct uh, percutaneous endoscopic uh, jejunostomy uh, tube. Same sort of approach. The first thing we have to do is identify our landmarks. And what we're doing there is we're going in with an endoscope. In the video, it's very hard to see. But we will go in with an endoscope, go into the right location, into the jejunum, and then turn the endoscope towards the belly wall. The room usually is dark so that you can, the outside individual or person that's doing it can see where they are. And, and based on that landmark, then a very small needle is placed. Um, and then again, the guide wires pass, pass through that uh, to make sure we're in the correct location. So that's it right there. And you can see the needle coming through. And once we know we're in the right location, um, then you can go ahead, give anesthesia, make your incisions, and then pass uh, the, the guide wire. So that's 
that's how we're going uh, about placing the direct uh, pedges. And here's the second catheter. So that's the bigger needle. Once we're confident we're in the right location, we can then pass the bigger catheter. And then again, they're using the snare here and they're passing their guide wire. So you can see very similar techniques, but this is much harder to do because of the location. You have to go in quite a bit compared to the stomach. Okay, so we'll you know, leave the questions for the end about how to place tubes, but then I wanna shift uh, to the second part of the talk, uh, which is uh, on NFIT. Um, which is one of the biggest transitions I think uh, whole enteral nutrition has seen in quite some time. Uh, and I've summarized uh, a talk that I've, I've given before uh, about why we need this connector. Essentially, um, you know, what's happening now is that one uh, typical patient that we see uh, could have many different tube systems. Uh, there's actually countless that are available on the market um, and sometimes we saw the data that Lisa presented. Many of these patients are being taken care of by uh, providers who don't manage many tubes. So if they get admitted to the hospital um, and the nurse or the physician um, is used to only seeing a few per year, mistakes can happen. The same thing I mentioned before about feeding into the stomach versus the jejunum you know, not being able to correctly identify this. So because of this, uh, mistakes do happen. Uh, and this is a, a perfect example from our institute uh, where, um, you know, a flush needed to be provided into the feeding end, but instead was provided into the balloon port. And the balloon can only handle like 10 cc's or more. Um, and the balloon actually ruptured, uh, the tube fell out. So. You can see this, this, this happens quite a bit. And this is not anything new. It's been reported in literature since the 70s, uh, with the earliest case being reported uh, of cow's milk, so milk um, actually being given uh, accidentally as an IV, uh, as opposed to in the stomach. Uh, the patient developed a severe reaction, but did, um, you know, survive. Uh, there's now over 116 cases that have been identified and reported on. Obviously, uh, many, I would say the vast majority, don't get reported. Uh, but those are the number of deaths that have been reported. So because of this, I think Joint Commission and other organizations focused on safety have identified this as a serious issue. Uh, and with this, um, we have been working now for uh, a number of years uh, to make a transition to a uh, tube that would try to rectify some of these issues. Um, with this in mind, uh, the Global Enteral Device Supplier Association was formed many years ago. Uh, those are the companies that came together to develop the standards uh, for these tubes, which then got uh, named ENFIT. And that's what it looks like there. So essentially, it's very similar to a lure lock system uh, but uh, the end-fit device, uh, you know, the feeding supplies will only connect to an end-fit device in, in a secure way. So that's the design behind this. Um, but as, as many of you have kind of brought up, as this was being developed, a number of issues were brought up, uh, and, it, and it's fair to bring those up here. Uh, the first issue was medications, especially in the neonate because of the design change uh, that was required uh, with the current tubes, if you can, can essentially visualize, um, you can see that on the right. Uh, the end is what's referred to as a, a female end with the supplies being a male end. This needed to be converted, uh, so it needed to be changed. And so because of it, there can be a little bit of uh, uh, adjustment that needs to be made in terms of uh, medications. You know, not all of the solution uh, goes out, so there could be underdosing or overdosing. Um, but the tubes have been redesigned, and uh, Getsa can kind of fill in more on this. Uh, so we think that issue has been uh, resolved. The other issues we uh, tackled uh, with a partnership with the FDA. Uh, first, 
issue was flow rate. Many of uh, the early NFIT um, tubes were tested and examined uh, with a pump feeding, and there they worked quite well. Uh, we then uh, built upon that, that testing and wanted to make sure that the needs of our patients, the home patients who provide gravity flow or provide bolus feeding would also be met. So with that in mind, uh, we set forth to do some flow rate testing. Um, and we, we partnered with the FDA to design this protocol. And then the GETSA members were kind enough to provide us tubes. Uh, and you'll see by the data, there were a lot of tubes that were required to do each testing because we did that in triplicate uh, and didn't want to use the same tube. So we had to just do this over and over again. Here's Lisa and uh, some of our other members of our team uh, that did this. Um, and it was, it was uh, days and days of work. It was hard work. But they're still smiling. I made them turn around and smile at least. So um, there they are. So this is what we saw, and we've kind of published these results. Um, as you can see in the black and, and white, those are the legacy tubes. Those are the, the current tubes uh, that we have, and, and we've essentially measured the flow rate in milliliters per second. And then in the pink are the end-fit tubes. And we did it for each size, and then we did it for a number of formulas, including water. So you can imagine how many different times we did this. Lisa can imagine for sure. Um, <laughs> she said she tried to forget. Um, but you can see one of the tubes uh, has a much slower flow rate, one of the NFIT tubes. And we think in terms of the 14 French, that contributed to the results you're seeing. In aggregate, when you combine all the NFIT versus the legacy flow rates, you can see uh, that the NFIT were slower again, largely due to that one NFIT tube, E1. But when we looked at the 18 French, there really wasn't a difference. Uh, with the 20 French, again, there was no difference. The 24 French, for some of the formulas, uh, once again, the flow rate for the legacy tubes was faster than the NFIT tubes. Um, fortunately for us, the FDA also repeated uh, this trial um, independently with independent tubes. They tested their own different uh, categories of formulas because that's been the hardest issue for us is that with food, with enteral feeding, there's so many different ways to do it. So how could we possibly test them all? So we had to be selective and pick, uh, you know, each institution kind of picked what they thought was a good range. And the FDA picked this batch you see there. Um, and then they showed their data in terms of legacy tube versus NFIT. So they converted their data, it's a big graph, but what you're seeing there is they're comparing a legacy tube made by one manufacturer to the same manufacturer's NFIT equivalent. Uh, and they're showing at the very end, if it took 20 minutes to feed in terms of the legacy tube, how long would it take to feed in terms of the NFIT tube? And so that's, that's what you're seeing there. And, and they did this again with all of the different tubes, the Legacy 2 to E2, um, and then the Legacy uh, 3 to E2. So all of those tubes have all of those data listed there. And this has also now been published. So uh, after we were done with the flow testing, the other part of things that we wanted to test was force. Many of our patients provide bolus feeds through a syringe, so we wanted to see if there would be any difference in terms of the force required to provide those feeds. Uh, we were able to go into our orthopedics lab, who do a lot of bone tensile strength measurements, and use some of their equipment uh, to measure the force that was required. Blenderized tube feeding, as many of you now know, is something that's really up and coming. Patients are demanding complete food um, and they're blending it themselves. So we also wanted to test, in addition to some of the formulas available, blenderized tube feeding as well. So we worked with some of the, the companies that actually produce commercial blenderized tube feeding, like Nourish and Real Food Blend. We tested those. 
we then also tested using our own recipe that we have. But that allowed us to also test blenders and mix time. You can see how many variables there are out there, right? So we, we at least pick three blenders that we felt would give us a good idea about the class, you know? So one is like the Osler blender, uh, then is the Ninja, and then the Vitamix, you know, which can take a shoe and kind of blend it. So um, we tested those, and then we tested uh, each formula three minutes of blending versus six minutes of blending to see if blending extra would also make a difference in terms of the force. So here we are again blending all of those uh, formulas with the different uh, um, mixtures. And this is what we saw in terms of the aggregate data. Um, so when we combine the NFIT data and the legacy data, you can see that when it came to the formula Jevity, the NFIT tubes actually required less force than the legacy. So the legacy tubes required more. Other than that, uh, there was no statistical difference. Uh, when it came to our recipe, um, you can see that the NFIT uh, tubes required a bit more force than the legacy for the 14 French. But the other tubes, there wasn't any uh, difference. We wanted to then take this to the next level and look at all those other variables. And so we were able to work with our statisticians and do regression model analysis to see which factor is the most important out of all this. Is it the recipe that's used? Is it actually the tube size? Is it like a 14 French versus a 24 French make a difference? Or is it legacy versus NFIT? And when we did that, you'll see each time the legacy versus NFIT actually fell out, meaning it wasn't significant. It was the recipe was the most significant and the tube size was second most. Uh, we did it again with our formula looking at the tube size, the blender, the time, and then again, legacy versus NFIT. And the same thing happened. Legacy versus NFIT uh, fell out when you adjusted for all the other variables. So tube size was important, the blender was important, and then time of blending also made a huge difference. So with that, I'll kind of close, leave it up to questions. Uh, I'm sure many will have questions, and then we can look at the tubes themselves. Did you use the largest uh, 24 French feeding tube above, I'm talking about inside diameter, outside diameter versus 24 French, but there are different size into your bowls. And this is what recent I use a hazard 0110 24 dangling uh, tube. I can fully insert a, I believe it's a 5.5 millimeters, uh, millimeters uh, drill bit into the port of my tube. So it has a tremendous bowl. Now, there's no way physically that these small tubes, 14 French and below, can gravity feed something. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I have a theory about your stomach. If you blend something six minutes, which is totally, absolutely unrealistic, I, I have a Ninja 1500-watt blender. I, I blend a ribeye steak for one minute and put it to my tube along with potatoes, green beans, whatever. And so this is real life. We're not talking about somebody uh, putting something that's been totally digested. I believe, and I think if y'all did research, it would bear it out, the less work your stomach does, the less work it will be able to do in the future. It's just like a couch potato. The couch potato that never walks, never runs, will soon become unable to do that. The stomach is the same way. Okay. And so I want my stomach to be able to digest the fine particles in my one-minute blended meal. 
that passed through my tooth. Now, I've invented a, a device here which I use if a particle going through my tube suddenly stops the flow of the blenderized tube. I simply run this down, down my testimony extension set, which I make because nobody in the industry provides such, uh, and it pushes that particle through my tube. I, d I use this for my uh, pills because I cannot even swallow my own saliva. I have a, a pump, I mean a suction pump, that I have to use to uh, suck the mucus out of my mouth and throat. So there are tens of thousands of us in the same situation, and you know, we're the uh, so-called silent majority out there. I'm not a feeding tube patient. I haven't seen a gastric doctor since 2014. I ha I've had my tube since 2013. When it breaks, I change it myself. I, I use a, the balloon type tube. And uh, if I were to have a problem, I would go to a doctor. But then, I'm not a patient. I just eat different than you do. And I, I, I really get upset by the first introduction of infant into my life because it would be like if I came to you, uh, Dr. Mundy or Lisa, and said, all right, this is your food for the rest of your life. You get a bottle of Taylor syrup for breakfast, a bottle of Taylor syrup for lunch, and another one for supper because the high fructose corn syrup uh, formula, which is on the market, is just about to equivalent on the glycemic index is table syrup. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Or is there any, any response to that that you would like to share? Um, sure, no, I mean, I think so, you know, that it's, it's, I don't know where to begin, but I'll <laughs> begin somewhere. Um, I think for us, the hardest challenge was what do we test, right? And um, it, it was such a diverse population out there and we wanted to make sure that we could test the breadth of, of things, uh, but keeping in mind that we actually, you know, wanted to make this as unbiased as possible, and so really used most of our own resources. We didn't want industry support in this because we knew how difficult and contentious this issue was, and so a lot of this was volunteer time, and Lisa, you know, and everyone, um, came in on weekends, uh, did it in the morning. So we, we had to make sure that our resources were used valuably. So we actually partnered with Oli and did a survey of what patients are doing out there and then took that information and said, what's the, the highest yield in terms of tubes? Um, you know, and, and did the most common, which would impact the majority of patients. So in terms of tube selection, there's no possible way we could have, uh, you know, added all of the tubes that are used out there. We we picked the majority. We we can't. Yeah, no. That's and that's in our disclosure that there's no way for us to capture everyone's tube that they use. Um, and then the same thing with the formula. Y you can now see on the market the growing desire for complete food the growing desire as you're bringing up for blenderized tube feeding. Um, because of it, there's so many products on the market. Uh, if we're doing each test in triplicate, I mean, we could be testing every day uh, of the week for months and not cover them all. Um, so that's why we had to be selective, and that's a limitation. It's a fair point to make in that that's a limitation of the work we did. We extrapolated from our survey data and said, well, what would cover the majority of, of patients, and that's that's what we did. But yeah, your point's valid. There's, okay, do you see that? Okay. Do you wanna add anything, jump in, grab um, Can you give us a, a timeline as far as how much longer do I have with my legacy products? I'm kind of stockpiling them at the moment, but um, I know they're <laughs> doing a, adapters or whatever, but um, can you give us an idea? Um, that I'd have to rely on the manufacturers. Um, I'll bring those brave guys up. Uh, 
guys and gals. But, um, y you know, for us, I think we've gone through kind of different models in different companies. If there's demand, I'm sure they may continue with uh, legacy, uh, as it seems, if there's demand, right? So it may not be a time issue. So we do have manufacturers coming in to address some of those questions more directly. We appreciate that. Um, and we'll, they'll be setting up in a few minutes. I'm sorry. OK, I'm going to give it to David first. And First of all, I'd like to say I never intend to use an in-fit connector, never. We've worked around, we've got ways we can work around it, thanks to Sanford and some other people on our team. Um, several manufacturers, AMT and some others, have committed to they're always going to have the legacy connector available. We've talked to them. Um, in-fit is not mandated by anybody. Well, California has... Well, not really. It just says a connector. It doesn't say the word in-fit. Yeah. So we've, we've talked to the lawyers out there. So I think we're referring yeah. to there is a law in California that states that um, the tube, the feeding tube and supply right. should only be able to connect to an adapter. Inter integral to integral. It, can, it cannot misconnect, but it doesn't talk about infit It doesn't at all. talk about the infit so, standard. In fact, the infit's in violation itself when it's implemented in California because it fits right into an adult trach. So they're violating, if you're using an infant in a California hospital, you're in violation of California law, 1279.7, California law, <coughs> excuse me, the law. Uh, so it's not, mandated by, it's not mandated by the ISO, it's not mandated by a joint commission, it's not mandated by the FDA. I have a letter home from the FDA that says it's not mandated. So, you know, we don't have to use it. If manufacturers agree to supply both, we're going to keep going with the old, the ones of us who want to do that. We, 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 you talk about misconnects. We went to the FDA with the FOI, Freedom of Information Act, and we got to report back. Went back 11 years. There was no misconnects that infant would have solved. None. I've got all the details of that if you want to see it. I'd be glad to go over it with you. Um, I don't know what you're testing, what you were using. We're using a 3.2 tube or whatever, but many tube feeders use, uh, Bard and Cook make 3.8 and 4.65 uh, tubes, and so some people are blending a lot of big meals in those tubes, steaks and whatever, uh, pizza. I put pizza in mine, I've done that before. You don't taste it only if you burp it. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, I, I, I just, uh, I'm not in favor of infit. I don't know why we're why we're doing it. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Wait, when, uh, let me interrupt for a second. Let me just let me say one thing. That the ISO 80369-3, which is in which is the infit portion of it, the enteral part of it, is only part of the solution, mm -hmm. and that's been acknowledged from the beginning, right? Um, that it's a it's a, one of many systems so that's I, I think that we're coming at this from a very we're jumping into the middle of a discussion rather than starting at the beginning um, and a lot of people I mean we have a lot of history right I mean we've been going through it well we don't actually we, have time yeah, to go from this we don't have time to go from the beginning but um, there is a lot David I'm not shutting you down I'm just I'm just trying to say um, what I wanted to say was that it's a it's a process and it's been a long discussion and a lot's happened um, and I think that we're at a at a, a point to continue that conversation we do have the manufacturers to talk and I think that you have been talking um, and that your points historically have been taken into account in some of the modifications that have been made to NFIT but I think that this is a valid point, and I'm hoping that there's a conversation um, that will continue as the manufacturers come up and that legacy hasn't been discontinued, am I right? Um, and where things go is part of the conversation still, I think, you know? 
but I want to ask you a question. So oh, I was just curious what the problem with NFIT is. Why you all are not in favor of it. I see your shirts. That was pretty clear. <laughs> Hard to miss. Yeah, why don't you like it? In a nutshell, just what's... Well, in a nutshell. <laughs> so in a nutshell, summarize. About the many, there's many negative things about NFIT. Uh, first is the flow rate. That's a problem. Uh, the flow rate of blenderized food through there. I, 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 I've told this before. I took a Subway sandwich and blended it up and used it to use my legacy stuff. And I didn't, I, no problem. The next night I blended the same sandwich, Subway Club, 32 ounces of fluid, both of them. Couldn't get it through an NFIT connector. That, well, that's one issue. I mean, there's like 16 or 18. <laughs> they go on and on. I mean, I don't know how much time we've got here. Well, that's what I say. It's, it's to have a full discussion about NFIT right now would not work. But we can have a full discussion about NFIT and how we can make it better. I'll be glad to show you. The, the, we got we got the, in, the infection problem for one thing. The, the Nelson Labs did a, a test on the on the moat area because debris builds up in there, bacterial buildup, and it was too numerous to count. The bio burden was just too numerous to count. So that's very dangerous for infants, especially who have a compromised immune system. Uh, that's another. I mean, it's just it's a ton. I don't think you want to let me do it all. So well, I, we'll run out of time. So yeah, I was going to say. Maybe you all can chat afterwards. I'm happy to talk to you too. I made the full transition over a year ago to NFIT. Now I'm a J tube pump fed formula patient or consumer. And so I'm happy, if that's your situation, I'm happy to talk to you as well. Um, because it's actually, for me, in some ways it's improved my quality of life. I don't, and I don't want to take up everyone's time now for that. For me, I would just say um, the concept of for the greater good is something, um, a lot of people don't report. You might have done a FOIA request, and I very much value and appreciate your interest and, and the time you've put into it, but a lot of people don't report things. Who wants to admit they made a mistake? Let me see your raise of hands. You know what I mean? So. That's true, but still it doesn't always happen. And so in things, especially us home consumers, we're doing things at home. So. It's a lot different than in a clinical setting. Um, the other thing I want to say is we had a, the majority of the portion of Dr. Mundy's presentation. Um, I hope you found it valuable. I know I did. Um, it wasn't until I met a really cool interventional radiologist who told me about low-profile feeding tubes. So I just want to mention that um, I always felt like I had a leash. I still do, but it's a lot less, I, I feel less tethered because of the option. It's not always an option for everybody, but. Um, I'm just going to put the plug in. So if you don't know what a low-profile feeding tube is, Dr. Mundy put a slide up. It's the one with the balloon, and it was short. And um, at least for me, it gave me an opportunity to feel more free, um, less tethered. Um, it's, for me, it was more comfortable. And um, I do yoga more comfortably now than I did before. So just I, I hope that you found that valuable, um, learning about all the different tube types. Um, are there any questions about that portion of the presentation? Do we need to wrap it up so the, oh yeah. How about this, are, are they moving? Well, I was gonna suggest that these guys stay here. Okay, yeah, and they can people can questions. talk, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and then we can have the manufacturers um, take their positions. Yeah, so um, the manufacturers are gonna be, Halyard Health and Moog are gonna be at this table the, with the black um, drape. And then, um, let's see. Moog is closest to me, Halyard is farthest. Then Cook is gonna be in the far, back right circular table, then Boston Scientific back there. Maybe you guys can raise your hands. Okay, in the far back, there you go. And then um, Medline. So as people kind of move into places, um, we can wrap it up. I just wanna ask or thank each of our presenters for doing such a great job.